Hi, I'm KS Garner, and you're listening to the Solo Nerdberg Podcast. Today, I'll be speaking with the creator, writer, and artist of the manga-inspired comic Accidental Renegades, Jeff Zainlotti, here to promote the comic's first issue currently on Kickstarter. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Love the show. Well, thank you for joining us today. But uh, outside my introduction, who is Jeff Zainlotti, and what are you about? Well, uh, I guess, you know, in, in a word, I'm, I'm about, you know, creating comics, uh, particularly the best comics that, that I can create. Uh, I published a, a one shot in 2021 in conjunction with Free Comic Book Day, uh, really just to prove that I could do it. Um, creating comics has been a passion of mine for a while, but not something I've ever really done. So being able to, to follow a, a you know, timeline, hit a deadline and create a product that was well received was something I always wanted to do. Once I did that and I realized that it's something that I can I can do and be successful at. I really wanted to start to tell my own stories. And that's where Zed Comics Original kind of became the brand in 2020. And Accidental Renegades is the current title that's, you know, work in progress right now. So how many stories did you write and illustrate before you finally took the plunge to publish one for a free comic book day? Which that, led was to the, the that was the first one, actually. That was the first one. Um, and, and I kind of tell... You know, when I tell people my story, one thing that I kind of come back to over and over again is it was during the pandemic. Obviously, a lot of people had a lot of free time, just like I did. You know, I was home. I really couldn't go. I couldn't do much. And I spent a lot of time arguing with people on the Internet and getting into, you know, virtual fights. And it was completely counterproductive and and frustrating. And I kind of made the promise to myself that I would take that energy and put it into something creative. So every time I wanted to debate someone or argue with someone, I used that time to sit and create something. Um, As I started to do that, I kind of had the epiphany that at the end of the year, I'm going to be a year older. I'm either going to be a year older having created a comic book, or I'm going to be a year older with making more excuses why I haven't done it. And as cliche as it sounds, I, I, you know, once you start to do the work, it becomes a lot easier to do. I started, I started creating projects. I started creating a timeline. I started following it. And at the end of it, I had a 22 page one shot comic book that I was able to get into about five local comic book stores in time for free comic book day. And just seeing my own work on the shelves, even if it was, you know, in conjunction with a giveaway, it's still in, in, inspirational enough that I wanted to continue doing it. So launched my first Kickstarter. It's in progress now. And, you know, it's pretty much been a, a very educational ride, but a really enjoyable one at the same time. Uh-huh. So speaking of the Kickstarter, um, what is Accidental Renegades about? Okay, well, the the elevator pitch is pretty simple. Accidental Renegades is a 36-page manga-inspired comic about bumbling, super-powered mercenaries who unintentionally ignite a global revolution. And it kind of answers the question is, how do you stay out of the public eye when you unwittingly become the most notorious people on the planet? Mm -hmm. It follows a a group of of people that just want to do what they can do to, to earn a living and live their lives and are unintentionally thrust into the public eye and how they deal with that notoriety and also with the fact that they have the power to perhaps do something about it. So it challenges the the typical superhero trope in that these are reluctant heroes. These are ones who don't want the responsibility of being heroes and have never sought it out, but really kind of have it forced upon them. And it kind of examines the way people react to to being put in a situation where they have to rise to it. Mm -hmm. So could you elaborate a little bit more on the creative process overall for Accidental Renegade. So you have a thought in your head of this story. It may have started out with something else or it may just have been this to outlining the story and then like the character creation. That's what I'm interested in is the character creations. Cause I read, you know, on the Kickstarter who these characters are. I was like, oh, it's such a neglected group of people. So the character creation to now promoting it on Kickstarter. Yeah. It's uh it's an interesting process because Unlike a lot of people, I, I'm kind of doing it all myself. I created the, the idea, I do the writing, and I do the artwork. So my process tends to be a lot more free form than I think a lot of other people's because I'm collaborating only with myself. I can take a lot of shorthand and, and come back around and write a page and then skip three pages, and then write another page and come back when I figure out how I want to fill in those gaps. So it's almost kind of like a one-man jazz ensemble in that I'm playing multiple instruments and are kind of able to fill in wherever I need to. So Mm -hmm. my process, as far as creating the actual script, tends to be a little bit scattershot. What I am very deliberate about, though, is the creation of the characters and the creation of the overall plot. When I sit down and I work on the script, I basically have an idea where it's going to start and where it's going to end. And those are, you know, the, the bookmarks of that that issue. Then each page I'll go through and I'll hit the high notes of what needs to happen on that page. I kind of do that to pay attention to the page turns and to keep the reader 
kind of involved in, and the way it works with the book is since the first page is part of the story, the page turns like where the, the reader actually has to turn the page comes on odd number pages. So I want to make sure that whenever I hit an odd number page, something happens at the end of that page that is big enough that it motivates the reader to turn the page. So I want to kind of end almost each odd number page on a cliffhanger because otherwise the reader's not necessarily motivated to turn the page. Having to know that is important because it allows me to plot it out in ways that I can hit those beats. So again, I, I kind of come back to the, to the jazz analogy because I want to hit certain beats at, at certain, in a certain cadence at certain times. That's kind of how that works. Then I go through and I start to figure out the panels and I start to figure out what's going to happen on each page. And I work the camera angles. And that's where I tend to, to edit myself over and over and over again and change things up because maybe something I want to do on page three would actually look better if I use that camera angle on page five. So there is a lot of, of self-editing at the art stage, probably more than the writing stage. That's essentially how my plotting process works. And then kind of to get back to your original question, um, what really drives the book are the characters. So what I wanna make sure is that each character has a unique voice. And the way that I choose to do that is I basically have a, a motto or a credo for each character. What's the one thing that, that drives that character forward? every time that that character is interacting, really what they're doing should be in service to that credo. So if, you know, one of the characters, his goal is he just really wants to be left alone. You know, he's had a, a pretty rough life. He's worked very, very hard. He just wants to earn enough of a living to be left alone. That's that character's motivation. So most of what that character does needs to come back to that. By mm -hmm. doing that, you end up with a character that's not only relatable, but consistently relatable. I like team books more than individual books because you get more diversity of perspectives i think in a team book every character has their own reason for doing something and their own reason for being there and i feel like as a reader you can relate more to that because you're more likely to find someone that is within your same personality type mm -hmm. so i mean it's a kind of a lengthy process but again um a lot of it as i go through it becomes a little bit more practiced and refined so i really take most of the time early on working on the character motivation and the major beats of each page. From there, I can kind of adjust it as much as I want. Five panels, four panels, one panel. That almost becomes secondary to making sure that those beats are hit. And once that happens, it gets the reader motivated to turn the page. So how did you come up with uh, the characters themselves? Because when I write, my characters kind of just come to me. They kind of just, I have this image in my head of what they, of what I want them to be. And I mean, I intentionally leave them like that. I don't really do anything with them or try to change them in any way. I don't try to fit them in the story. I try to make the story around them in a way. So like you have uh, like a bunch of different uh, characters. Let's see, on, I'm looking on the page right now, right? So you have a war veteran and then you have... Um, what was it? A brawler. It was, if I can go back to the beginning. Um, let's see. An alcoholic alien, a Hindu ninja vampire, a cyborg. Um, just a bunch of different, in a collect, like I said, an eclectic group of characters. So how did you come up with these characters? Did they kind of just come to you or did you intentionally create them like this? I think it's a little bit of both. I would tell you that behind the scenes, the, these characters have gone through so many different iterations. I'm sure you can relate to the way the character ends up is almost never the way the character starts out. Mm -hmm. um, they go through both personality iterations as you realize that, that they don't necessarily work together unless certain characters change to either be a source of friction or a source of support to one another. And also the visuals of the characters change. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that each character embodied something that, that would both be, like I said, a source of friction with one another, because there needs to be friction within that team dynamic, but there also needs to be support. I've read comic books, especially from the nineties where, you know, it's a team book and they look like they hate each other. Like all they do is insult each other the whole time. And I'm like, uh -huh. well, why, why would you be on that team with those people? If you, you know, if you didn't, you don't have to. So I wanted to create more of a family atmosphere and, you know, you know, you don't always look, my mother's fond of saying, you don't always like your family, but you always love your family. Uh -huh. So these are a group of people who at the end of the day will always have each other's backs, but won't necessarily get along throughout the process. So the personalities of the characters need to be such that they can create that friction. As far as the design of the characters, and because I'm also drawing it, I want to make sure it was a character design that is enjoyable and fun and, and unique enough. 
I really, in this book, try to get into defining the shape language between each character. So there's one character whose shape is defined more by circles, another character whose shape is defined more by triangles, and one is defined more by squares. By having that shape language, not only does it make each character visually unique, but it also gives them enough of a, of a, um, a, a dynamic silhouette that if they were all just on a page in silhouette, you would be able to tell them apart. So from the writing perspective, you want to make it so that the plot is engaging. But from the art perspective, you want to make it so it's something that's interesting to look at. And, and that balance was probably one of the bigger challenges with this book. Yeah, I never really noticed before. Um, I mean, I would when I'm reading the comics, but I don't think a lot of people realize how much the characters all kind of like look similar. They look a little too similar and you can't yeah. really tell who is who, even though, you know, they all have different names and different backgrounds. But it's like they all are slim they're all uh, right. muscular they're all are tall and it's like who's who in this on this page you yeah, know other yeah. than you can't really tell other than their name when they're when their name is spoken you can't really tell who is who so right I, visually you can easily tell who is who as far as like um i guess when the first time you see uh read their name or you know is this person or you can identify something with them and again like you said the shape in their silhouette um, you can definitely tell who it is. Yeah, and and one thing I tried to achieve as much as I could in this book is having a certain degree of diversity and not just in the, the characters themselves, but in the character designs. Mm -hmm. um, I want diversity because I want anyone to be able to pick up this book and, and hopefully see a little bit of themselves in it, regardless of who they are. But I also wanted the diverse, diversity of design because it's just more visually interesting. Like mm -hmm. you said, if you know every single woman has an hourglass figure and every single man is you know huge and muscular, that's great if that's what you want but it doesn't necessarily help those characters stand out visually in any way other than their hair color or, you know, the, whether or not they have a cape, for example. Mm -hmm. And to me, those books are fine. There's nothing wrong. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, trying to, you know, take a dump on any of those books. They're, they're awesome for what they are, but it just isn't what I was trying to do with this. Uh -huh. So let's go a little bit back to um, you pretty much doing everything in, in this comic. So did you ever was it always the plan to do it yourself or did you ever contemplate bringing on other collaborators? Did that ever happen or you just went straight to just doing it on your own? Um, as far as collaborators, I'm not, I don't know that I would necessarily want to do that yet. I definitely want to tell my own stories my own way. Um, mm -hmm. If I could find, you know, for example, if I would collaborate with anyone, I would collaborate on the art side and I would, would write it. I would be, you know, interested in looking into that if I can find an artist that I think can take it to the next level. Um, I would also like to collaborate with a colorist because that's something as a manga inspired book, it's going to you know be black and white with some very basic colors. Um, coloring is something that is not necessarily my strength and it's very time consuming. So in order to have a Kickstarter that can get out on time, I chose to do it largely in black and white. I would be interested in seeing how these pages would look with color on them. Um, but as far as collaborating, I'm not at all against the idea. I think it's difficult because these stories are personal at this point. I'm not sure how comfortable I am with just letting someone, you know, kind of play in that toy box just yet. Um, not because I think I can do it better, but just because there is a certain degree of, of myself in these characters, I think. Um, so I feel like almost I'm not ready, if that makes any sense, to let them go to someone else. Yeah, yeah, it makes total sense because it's so personal to you and kind of just handing it over to someone else in whatever aspect it may be, whether they're even just editing it or um, they're uh, illustrating your panels for you. Like you have to still give them a script and they'll illustrate it for you. And it's like, oh, well, that doesn't really make sense. So, yeah, you not being ready to, I guess, I wouldn't say not ready to compromise, but not really to not ready to i guess make any changes to it as of yet i mean eventually you will but right now this is a story that you want to kind of just get out right. there yeah and I, yeah i totally understand that yeah and i mean i i do i do know from the outside looking in it it does appear to be a little bit of maybe you know ego or stubbornness and i don't necessarily think it's that because the truth is i would love to see what other people could do with these characters i mean it, you know there are artists i admire that i would be honored to see what they could do with something that I may have dreamt up. That would be the dream. I'm just not sure I'm there yet, you know? Yeah. So I, I know I'll get there and I would be looking forward to that opportunity. It's just not going to happen with the first few books, I don't think. Yeah, that makes sense. So switching gears a little bit from um, artists to 
uh, I guess you'd say owner or founder. So how did you develop Z Comics? Did you always want to have a, your own like brand or publishing uh, brand or was it something you thought of doing after writing and creating for such a long time? Um, it kind of came out as an idea, more or less, I don't want to say on a whim, but it wasn't mm-hmm. something I had been planning out for a long time. Um, and it basically came from, I wanted to create comics, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to create comics under my name or under a, for lack of a better word, a brand. Uh-huh. And what I kind of decided is we'll come up with a brand because then the brand isn't married to just one person. So, you know, if this does become something that's more than just the X Center Renegades or, or anything like that, it's not, you know, Jeff Zanilotti, it's Z Comics original. It's, it's more of a title. Um, there was already a Z Comics on one of the social media. So I threw the original at the end. So I, you know, that came from a, a, an anime that we used to watch. So I just made it Z Comics original or, or ZCO and kind of just branded it from there. So it's certainly not, you know, it's not like an image or, you know, a top cow or anything like that. It's, it's not a brand in that respect. But it's a brand in the fact that it's something that is not necessarily tied to me because I didn't know if I wanted to be like, oh, well, this is a Jeb Zanilotti comic or is it a Zed Comics original comic? Uh, by putting the brand on, I feel like it makes it more of something that anyone can relate to. You know, mm-hmm. that's 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 Zed Comics. It's not that person. It's that that group and, you know, making you feel more of like a, a fraternity, more of like a family atmosphere. Uh huh. Exactly. So what advice would you or could you offer to other artists that you wish someone would have told you when you first started either it can be the when you first started the kickstarter or it can be even when you first started um just even just creating in general or even when you did your one shot well there there's two things and i'll answer it i guess in two parts the first is from the the Mm -hmm. creative aspect and i know it's cliche and i don't want to sound like one of those people but just just start doing it it's never going to be as good as you want. You know, you're always going to look and always want to do something differently. But if you wait until you're ready, you're never going to be ready because there's always going to be something that, that keeps you from moving forward. If you're always holding yourself back, I wish I'd learned that lesson years ago. I mean, I'm super excited. I created a comic book. It was in bookstores, you know, or in comic book stores in 2021, but why didn't I do that in 2020 or 2019 or 2018? It could have been done at any point. Um, it just happened when it happened because I finally just sat down and started doing the work. And I'll be honest with you, there's a couple of pages in that book because I had to hit deadline that I don't like to look at because I don't think it's my best work. But I had to get it to the printer in time in order to get it back to get it in the stores by free comic book day. Mm-hmm. And that's OK, because I think if you talk to anyone, they're always going to say, I wish I had a little bit more time, but I had a deadline and I'll fix it. I'll do it better in the next book. So that's kind of what drives me forward. From a creative aspect, I would say, don't wait. It's not going to do you any good to hold on. Just start doing the work now. The other side, and something that I wished I'd done a little bit earlier, was, as you know, the the indie comics community is is a great community. There's lots of people there who want to help, who want to offer advice, who want to be there to support you. And I wish I had entered that tribe, for lack of a better word, a little bit sooner. I have made a lot of great friends. I made a lot of great connections, and I've learned a tremendous amount in a relatively short time of being a part of those communities. Had I joined sooner, I might have been able to probably make some progress quicker. There's a wealth of information out there. And I was surprised at how many people are willing, not just not just okay with, but but willing to reach out to help you. They're knowledgeable, they're professional, they're they're you know tops in, in the indie comics field. They're putting out some amazing inspirational work and they're good people. So that's not something you can say about a lot of industries, but it's definitely something you could say about the indie comics one. There are there's a side of it that you know, is not useful, is not necessarily my speed, but there's another side of people that are great and they're open and they're, they're willing to hear about diverse opinions and willing to engage you on great ideas. And those people are, are worth their weight in gold. Yeah. 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 What I've learned is you'll never have enough money and you'll never have enough time. Yeah. And I've learned to, um, I guess in order to part of the collaboration process is being a resource to other people in order for them to be a resource to you as well, if that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, But in order for that to happen, you kind of have to have some type of experience. So even if, you know, you put this work out and you really didn't like it, you still have the experience. You have more of it than you did before you even started. So yeah, it's like I said, you, you never have enough money and you'll never have enough time. So just go ahead and get started. And like you said before, you know, you'll be one year older a year from now, regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, but throughout this whole process, 
do you or did you ever get overwhelmed? Um, does it ever become too much? You know, I, I read on your website that you're a family man and then, you know, friends and, you know, your your job, if you have one outside of creating comics and just even trying to have some alone time, even just to be with yourself. <laughs> so when it does become too much, how do you typically manage your mental well-being? Well, I find one of the challenges for me um, is, is just that is finding enough time to do everything. Um, I, you know, I, I tend to lead a, a, you know, a personality wise, I tend to be a little regimented. I, I like schedules. I like, you know, having some sort of organization. So I'll oftentimes build schedules and, you know, I need to get this done by a certain day. And that kind of helps keep me on track and also allows me to have some free time. Uh, this is something I do as a, a labor of love. I'm actually a high school teacher. So I do have a nine to five. The good news is that gives me the summers with a little bit more free time to get some work done. But the summers are also, you know, when you do vacations, you hang out with family and you have to do all those those chores that you, you put off all year. So finding the, the time is always the hardest part. As far as, you know, mental well-being, a lot of times I will kind of zone out while I'm working. Um, I used to listen to music a lot. Now I still do, but I also listen mostly to podcasts or, or watch YouTube videos that are having the background because just listening to people talk about the craft sometimes helps me solve problems. And in the act of solving problems, it helps bring a little bit of relief because the thing that was stressing me out before, I now have a way to kind of go around to fix it. So, so that's definitely been helpful for, for keeping mental well-being in check. Um, exercise, sleep, diet, you know, those things that artists never get to do. Um, I try to carve out enough time to do because it, it definitely has been helpful uh, for me. But one thing I learned, you know, with a Kickstarter, you can set your own schedule and that's great. You know, it gives you the time to kind of put it within your, your own confines. Uh, but with the one shot for free comic book day, free comic book day was on a schedule date. So I had to get the book done. I had to get it to the printer. I had to get it back and I had to get it delivered prior to that date. There was no, okay, well, I'll do it the next day because the next day is not free comic book day. You know, mm -hmm. on, a, on a Kickstarter, on a crowdfunding, if you want to send it out in October and you send it out on the 1st of November, no one's really going to get that upset. Most people understand independent comics is a difficult thing to do. But if you promise local stores that you're going to have a book for free comic book day and you don't get a free, you know, the book there in time, it hurts you professionally and also hurts your opportunity to get your stuff out there. So I had a very, very strict schedule where I had calendar and I had what needed to get done on what day. Um, if I got ahead, that was great because the odds were good that sometime during that process, I was going to fall behind. So get ahead one day, fall behind another, and you stay on schedule. That helped me. Um, actually got the book to the printer. The printer actually got it back quicker than originally expected, and that was a blessing. But at the same yeah. time, it was kind of like, damn it, because if I would have known, I would have spent a little bit more time working on some of the pages. Mm -hmm. um, they said, you know, two weeks, and I literally had the book back in like six days. So, oh, wow. you know, it was great. It was a, a great problem to have, but it still, you know, was programmed into the timeline. So um, that helped me a lot. And I think if you have a plan, even if it's not perfect, that takes a lot of stress because you know you at least have looked at this and you have some way to, to get after it. So having a plan, then following the plan and being flexible definitely helped out. Uh -huh. I feel like as artists, we either have a strict regimen or we don't have anything at all. It just kind of just comes to us. And I feel like we have to maybe just find a way to meet in the middle. But this, I guess this this lifestyle or career path, whatever you want to call it, it, you're constantly making adjustments all the time. Like if you had, if you did know that you would get it back sooner, you would have taken more time to work on your stuff. Yeah. But then who knows, they might've had an issue when you finally did send it to the printer and you wouldn't have gotten it back at all. You right, know? right. So it's like, and you just have to, I think it's better that it was done earlier than trying to make the adjustment to make it work in a way. So, but what I'm trying to say is that you're, we're constantly making adjustments or having to adapt to whatever happens. And that's why having a, like a, an outline or um, I guess a list of things that need to be done, like maybe within like a week, but giving allowing yourself the grace of like free time and making mistakes and just kind of like going going with the flow you need that as well so we kind of just have to find a way to meet in the middle that i think that's where i am right now because i did have a list of stuff but then 
I was getting it done too quickly. And then I didn't have anything at all, but then I had a bunch of stuff I had to do. So it was like trying to find a way to meet in the middle in a way. Yeah. And I think you make a really good point because even if in that, in that case, I knew that I had, let's just say an extra 10 days, I'm not sure I would have necessarily done more work. I would have done the same amount of work, just spread out a little bit more. So you, you make a very good point there is it's easy to look back in hindsight and say, oh, if I knew I had those extra days, I would have done things differently, but I'm not hundred percent sure I would have because it just would have made the schedule spread out a little bit more. Arguably, an extra day would probably mean that the work would be a little bit more refined, but that's not to say it would be perfect. And I think every artist, you know, I'm sure you can relate, you know, when they hit a deadline, it's like, oh, I really wish I had a little bit more time to do that. But you're never going to have enough time because if you had time to do that, now you'd wish you have time to do something else. And there's always going to be something, especially if you're, you know, you drive yourself to be the best you can be and you're critical enough, you're never going to be 100% happy, I think, with, with the entire product. And that's mm-hmm. not a bad thing. You know, that's, huh. I think it's a good thing that, that as individuals, you're driving yourselves to be better. Yeah. So my last question for you, Jeff, is what is your idea of success? So I ask that because as creators, if we're not getting regular paychecks from a full-time job or making consistent revenue from our art, we consider failures or we consider ourselves failures. Many of us will put our dreams and projects on a back burner or give them up altogether because this career path can be highly intimidating and competitive. So what is your idea of quote unquote success? You know, it's a great question. It's almost impossible to answer because I think depending on when you ask that question, the answer is going to be a little bit different, right? So right now, my if you would ask me, you know, three days ago, my goal for success would have been having the Kickstarter funded. Um, the Kickstarter for Accidental Renegades actually hit its funding goal yesterday. And now it's at about 125% funded. So that goal's met. So if that was my measure of success, and at that time it was, now that that measurement is, is unnecessary. So I guess my next measurement is to get the book done. Really, my measure of success is to have a complete story that I can get in people's hands, um, to be able to reach people with the story that I want to tell. In a perfectly great universe, it would be a multi-million dollar project and it would be on you know movie screens everywhere, but that's not realistic. Mm-hmm. What my measure of success is, is to get the story that I'm working on done and out into the hands of the people that want to read it. Once that's done, my measure of success is going to be get the next story done and in the hands of people who want to read it. So I think by constantly having a measure of success that is a moving target, you know, you're never satisfied. You don't ever get complacent, but you're always making forward progress. So right now, my measure of success is to get the book done and in the hands of people who want to read it. Once that's done, my measure of success is to get the next book done and in the hands of the people who want to read it. Uh-huh. So how many issues or like, I guess, yeah, how many issues do you plan to to create, I guess? Is it like um, but, arcs or? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 an arc. I have it mapped out as an arc idea. And essentially it works out to three or four arcs or three or four issues per arc and about five arcs total. And it's, you know, a long process. One of the reasons that I say that Accidental Renegades is manga inspired is because I tend to enjoy the the energy and the, the artistic, um, I guess, style of, of manga. Uh, so it's a regular Western comic book, but it has a lot of manga inspirations. But one thing that I, I appreciate about most manga is that they're finite, right? They have a, a beginning point. And they eventually are scheduled to end. Mm-hmm. You know, Batman, Superman, they've been around since, what, the 30s, you know, 40s, late late 30s, early 40s. And those stories are still mm-hmm. going. And that's awesome. But it's very daunting for a reader to pick up a Superman comic book and, and kind of understand where it's at if they were just reading it today because there's so much history and so much lore to that character. By comparison, for many manga, with few exceptions, you can pick up and and get the entirety of the story in a relatively short period of time, much like a movie. So, you know, Western comics are kind of like The Simpsons have been on for decades, whereas manga is almost kind of like a miniseries or a movie. It it has a start point and an end point. So I do have an ending scheduled for the Accidental Renegades, but it's, you know, it's out there a little bit. Each arc is really designed to tell the backstory of one of the main characters. So by the time you get to about five arcs, you should be able to get the full backstory of what motivates each character, what drives them as you get to the conclusion of the story. Uh huh. And I just thought of another question. Um, how did you work it out with the local stores to get your books in there for free comic book day? It actually was easier than I thought. I'll be honest. I was kind of like, 
I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. So like, I was kind of, you know, nervous and I didn't want to just go in and for lack of a better word, cold calling, you know, local comic shops. And I went first to the comic book store I've been shopping at for years. I know the owner for, for quite a while. And I kind of asked him and he was like, yeah, absolutely. Cool. And he kind of gave me some advice. Right. So my idea was to just hit the five local comic shops within like whatever mile radius. And he's like, don't do that because, and this was coming from him as a, a long, you know, 20 plus year comic book shop owner. He understands the industry. He goes, because what people do, and I never really understood this is they hit up all the local stores. So a guy will go to this store, then he'll go two miles down to a next town over, hit the next store. Then he'll go to 10 miles away and hit that store. So you're hitting up all the stores and you're getting the maximum bang for free comic book day. He says, if you put your books in all the local stores, it's going to be the same people basically saying it. What mm -hmm. you need to do is you need to spread out, right? And I live on Long Island. So it's, you know, like the name applies on Long Island. So I hit, you know, one on the South Shore, one on the North Shore, one on the East Shore, one on the West Shore. And I got uh, four or five stores total, kind of spread out within about 30 minutes of each other so that it was a, a large enough area that different people would be seeing it. And every comic book store, there was one guy, he was... He didn't see, he was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. You know, he didn't really sound like he was super duper into it, but he didn't want to tell me he wasn't super duper into it, but whatever. Everyone else though was great. One store was like, Hey, if you want to come in and, and hang out and sign books, that'd be great too. Um, but that day, just as it worked out, the day of free comic book day was my daughter's sweet 16. So I was like, I can't be anywhere, but there, like, I, uh -huh. I would love to, but I can't do it. So in the morning I ran around dropping off books in the afternoon, I was at the sweet 16. So, you know, I didn't, didn't get a chance to really be there for it. But, you know, got photos, got video, and that was that was really cool. Every comic book store owner, like I said, was super receptive. Their only concern was that it was appropriate for free comic book day. That mm -hmm. didn't have, you know, violence, nudity, or anything, you know, explicit, which it didn't. Um, so they were more than happy to support it. And a couple of them kind of sent emails later about how it was received. So, um, again, I tended to make it out to be a lot harder than it was going to be when I actually did it. Um, everyone I talked to was totally fine. They were They were happy to help. Um, no one was difficult about it. I probably made it out to be a bigger deal than, than it really was. So that, that was, and then to have pictures of my book on shelves was really cool. That's something I'll cherish for a while. Yeah. I mean, this is your first time publishing your work and putting it out there. So of course you're going to be a little anxious about how people are going to receive it. And then you're going into these business businesses, whereas like they're here really to make money, but you're kind of just giving your stuff away for free in a way. So it's like, yeah, customers are coming in and they're buying stuff, but they're not buying this. And I mean, free comic book day is free comic book day. That's what it is, is, yeah. you know, to get people to come in and grab some free stuff and then maybe buy some other stuff as well. So maybe that's why the other guy may have had a problem. I don't know. But yeah, it's just, you're really anxious about how people are going to receive your work, but how, how did they receive it? How was that? Uh, it was, it was pretty well received. Um, I want to say there's probably about 75 books total. So about 30 to 30 or so books per location. Then I had some that I kept extra and they all went and, you know, uh, gained a couple of followers on social media. Uh, but I did get an email from, um, someone who, you know, works in the business and he basically said, Hey, saw your book, loved it. Great energy. Keep it up. Um, which was, again, was great. Like that's something I'll cherish. You know, they didn't have to stop and write an email to a stranger saying that they, they liked it and they did. Um, mm -hmm. and a little research, you know, they've been in the comic book industry for, for, you know, quite a while. So, you know, that, that meant a great deal to me. Um, it's always great to get something that kind of validates the work you're doing. And aside from that, um, you know, it's just to have, like I said, to have the book on the shelf, to see people carrying the book out, you know, I kind of want to be like, Hey, I, you know, I did that. That was me. That was me. But again, I felt like that was the weird thing to do in hindsight. It probably wouldn't have been a big deal at all, but like, I felt kind of weird being like, I, you know, that book, I, I did that. That's, that's my name. Look, here's my ID. Um, <laughs> I figured that would be weird. So I, I definitely didn't do that, but you know, they're, they're comic book fans. They probably would have thought it was really cool. Uh-huh. So is there anything else that you want to touch on about accidental renegades that I may have missed? Um, maybe talk about rewards for potential backers, anything else with the Kickstarter? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the Kickstarter is live right now. Um, it's the first Kickstarter I've done. So, you know, I wasn't hundred percent sure. I didn't want to get too crazy with the award tiers. I want to have something that was manageable so that the backers get exactly what they're promised. Mm -hmm. So right now there's four award tiers total. There's the, the digital tier, which is the lowest level where you get a digital copy. Um, there's the physical tier, 
Uh, there's a tier that includes the physical copy and a unique sketch that, that I'll draw and include with it. And then there's the highest tier, which is the physical copy, the sketch, and the opportunity to have you or your logo drawn into the book. Um, because it's a, a, the first issue has a lot of crowd scenes, um, takes place in, in several, you know, several city type environments. There's lots of opportunities to draw individuals in. So I, I'll be honest with you, I was surprised by how many people chose that option. I thought most people would choose the digital option because it is the lowest level. Um, mm -hmm. But most people have chose the, the higher level. And I think it's because there's an opportunity to kind of put yourself or something that you like in the book. Uh, it's very expressly put in there. Like, I'm not putting anything political. I'm not putting anything, you know, um, inappropriate. You know, I have the final say. So if you send a logo that is grossly inappropriate, it's not going to go in the book. Um, but for the most part, it's most people like, hey, you know, a picture of me, you know, wearing this hat or whatever. That's fine. So those are, are the tiers. Now, the top level tier is going to end at the end of July. Mm. <laughs> because I didn't, I honestly did not expect it to be that many people. And I'm like, well, this is a book that kind of takes place in like a dystopian alien type future. I don't want to have this many humans in it. And there's a, like a lot of people now that I'm going to have to figure out how to draw in. So I was like, you know, I, as much as I hate to do it, I, I think that is just going to be, a, that is a temporary tier that is going to end, you know, at the end of this month. So if anyone wants to get in, they don't have a lot of time left to do that. Um, but it has been, like I said, it's been great. It hit its funding yesterday. It's about 125% right now. The first stretch goal goes into effect at, at it's a $1,500 Kickstarter. So the first stretch goal goes into effect at 2000. It's about, I want to say 17, 1800 right now. Um, that Kickstarter allows it to be upgraded paper, foil cover, um, a much better quality book. The other thing that I will say, backers at every level get their name printed in a appreciation page in the book. Um, I've talked to some other people and they usually keep that at, you know, once you hit this certain level, that's where it goes. But the way I look at it is if you're going to give me your money, you know, I appreciate that. And whether you give it to me at the lowest level or the highest level, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you're supporting the product and your name is going to go in the book. So regardless of what level anyone goes in, their name's in the appreciation page. So um, I've backed about 30 something books on Kickstarter, a couple others on Indiegogo and Crowdfunder. Um, I've supported what I could. You can't always support the top level, but that doesn't mean that you don't really care about the book. And I appreciate everyone who's giving me their money. So no matter what level they, they back it, they're getting their name in it because that's my way to thank them for, for supporting it. Yeah. So the top tier to be in the book, can it be, can it be, or like, do they have to be human or maybe putting their logo on there? Cause maybe they can be a different character or yeah, a different species, I, but like a logo on a hat or on a t-shirt right, or something like right. that. Instead. Yeah. And, and so there's the opportunity to do it on logos, on t-shirts, on hats. Um, there's the opportunity, you know, to do a alien type character modeled after someone. Um, and that's something that we're all going to have to get into once the Kickstarter closes. You know, I've had a couple people that are, that are friends that I, I know and they were like, Hey, I backed this, you know, can you put, you know, my dog, you know, with a machine gun, you know, wearing a helmet. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I, that would work great because it fits with the theme of the book uh -huh. much more so than having, you know, a middle-aged white guy in a crowd of aliens. Right. Yeah. So like, I would prefer to do those because number one, I think it fits the theme. And also it's probably a little bit more fun to draw. Um, but yeah, as far as the, the, the logos or the, the images, you know, that's something that's definitely open to interpretation of what the individual wants to do. There might be some back and forth if someone wants something that just doesn't fit, you know, with the theme of, of you know, an alien world, you know, I don't think that'll be an issue, but there's a lot of flexibility because it is a lot of crowds, a lot of city, you know, there's a lot of ways to put a lot of people in the crowd. So I think it's, it's definitely doable. Uh-huh. So do you plan on doing any cons or anything local in your area that people can come and see your work and maybe get something signed? If, even Absolutely. If they do yeah. have um, the free comic book. Like, did you sign any of those free comics or? No, you... actually, I didn't. I didn't sign any of them. Um, but, you know, I can definitely do another print run of that book. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking to table at local cons. Um, I'm looking to table at some larger cons once I have a, a, you know, a few more things, but I want to be able to have right now I have a book, right? So I want to be able to have more than that book. If I can table with two books and some prints and some stickers, that I think is, is pretty much where I want to start as a limit. I don't want to table with anything less than two books because I think it's very hard to get people to stop when you only have like one thing to offer them. I want to be able to have something that is a little bit more of options. Um, I've been 
you know, as a guest to, to several cons. And unless that one book is just blowing my mind, that one book probably isn't going to get my attention as much as a table where I can stop and I can look at a couple different things. So mm-hmm. I want to be able to give people who are stopping at the table. And then with more than one book, you can offer deals, right? Like, you know, this book is $10, this book is $7, but if you buy both, it's $15. So like there are ways that you can give more to the customer if you actually have more to offer them. So uh, once this book's done, um, looking to, to start tabling at cons and try to get the word out there as well. Okay, cool. So again, I want to thank the creator, writer, and artist of the manga-inspired comic Accidental Renegades, Jeff Zelotti, for joining us here today to promote the comic's first issue currently on Kickstarter. I highly recommend our listeners to give Jeff's Kickstarter a look, share, and back if they can. All of Z Comics' socials and website will be listed in this episode's details alongside the Kickstarter link for those who are interested. Again, I am KS Garner, and you have been listening to the Solo Nerdbrick Podcast. Thank you. Bye, everybody.